thought, please. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. My name is Danette Fenton Menzies and I'm the Director of Learning at Magical Learning. Um, in terms of this particular webinar, we know a number of you um, are either working from home or your kids are just at home because school um, has been cancelled or maybe you're just supporting your kids through these times. And what we know is that you know, it can, it, if we stressed, it can also impact on our children. So we thought this webinar would be helpful um, to help you learn as well. Now, I'm not sure, can you still see me on the video, everyone? Just making sure you can. Yes, you can, it's all right. Thank you, Jolene, welcome. Welcome back again. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, it's great to see everyone. Can, can you hear me? Now, can people hear me? That's the other thing Graham just asked. Yes, Marg says yes, so, all right. All right, well, let's start. To let you know uh, my experience, my husband Graham and I have raised five children. Um, three of them now work with us in our business. And we've been running training um, organisations for the last 21 years. I'm a massive learner, love, love, love to learn. And so over the years, we've learned a number of things that have helped us to help our students um, and our kids learn. So what we're going to be covering today is the latest brain science around how do we learn? And particularly, what are the different ways we can support our children to learn more effectively? One of the things you're going to discover in this, that you, this webinar is that breaks are super important for helping our children to learn. Um, this also applies to us as adults. So I would encourage you if you are working from home and you haven't been on any of our previous webinars, uh, we talk a lot about breaks. Um, so we'll talk about the science behind that. And then what are some simple ways you can help your children learn more effectively? We will send you at the end of this webinar, if you've signed up um, on our website, a copy of the slides, a copy of the resources. So there's a couple of slides um, at the end with different resources to support you. And also a copy of this um, webinar recording in the next couple of days. So that will help support you. Um, and we're gonna send over the next six weeks or so, a couple of other emails with some short videos to help support you as well. If at any time you need additional support, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at learn at magicallearning.com. And I'll repeat, repeat that a couple of times. Uh, we're here to help and it's not about um, any cost at all. It really is about supporting our community. So if we can help you, just please reach out. All right, I love quotes. People who know me know that I love quotes. Curiosity about life in all of its aspects, I think, is still one of the secrets of great creative people. And, you know, if we think about learning, creativity, people being curious about it, is the way that you get engagement. And we're going to talk about that shortly. So us being able to encourage that curiosity in our children helps make them um, more active learners in growing themselves, growing their learning, and hopefully getting them to share their learnings with us as well. So I've got a question and we're gonna use the chat box. So um, you'll notice if you swiggle your mouse, um, for me it's at the top of my screen, it might be at the bottom of the side of your screen, you'll get a um, menu bar. On that menu bar, it's got three dots on the right hand side and it's got the thing more. Some of you have already accessed it because you've started using the chat box. But I'd love for you now in the chat box to share um, a funny or a um, you know, humorous for you experience that you've had with your children learning at home. So please feel free. Um, one of the things we know about learning is that laughter is a massive way to increase um, learning. We re remember it more, which is why YouTube, etc., with their funny videos has done so well. So if your kids have done anything um, funny over the last little while, please would love for you to share it. Or if, if you're like, oh no, please feel free to share that as well. <laughs> your kids are beautiful. And I won't say our names when you put these in the chat box so your kids can't go, oh, mum, oh, dad, did you really say that? <laughs> um, I know with our kids, they were always doing fun things. Our kids were so blessed, I think, in, in a lot of ways, although they might disagree with us. But we had, um, for a long time, training at home. 
and our training rooms, the kids would come home with their friends and it would be set up with pipe cleaners and lots of fun things. And the kids were like, oh man, I wish our, our school was like this. So we thought we were on a winner when we made it lots of fun, bright colours, etc. If you can do that at home, it often makes kids want to hang around in those areas. All right, looks like no one's got any funny stories, but feel free if you remember some as we go to share them. Now, I do have a question for you, and I really would love for you to share in the chat box. Um, oh, thank you. And I won't say your name, but you know who you are. Your 11-year-old soon-to-be um, has told me would prefer to go to school. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that's sad, isn't it? Well, after today, I bet they'll be wanting to stay at home. <laughs> I, I had the same issue when I... Um, managed to um, cut, well, I was pretending to be a hairdresser once for my son and he said, mummy, can I go back to Malcolm from now on? <laughs> I relate exactly to that one. <laughs> oh, and thank you for sharing, made me laugh. I bet it made a few others chuckle. <laughs> uh, yes, there has been excitement about not having to go to school, followed by tears realising that schoolwork would continue. <laughs> oh, I love it. Now, the next question that I've got up on the slides is, what are some of the challenges you're experiencing supporting your children to learn at home? And here I will use your name so you know that I'm reading it. Um, I like that too. Um, the kids are actually doing each other's lessons, um, year five and year 10, and they think it's hilarious, <laughs> I bet they do. And you know, what a, that's actually not a bad way to learn, and we'll come back to that one. So if you've got any particular challenges supporting um, your children, please feel free to put them in the chat box. I love the interaction. It's hilarious. You can see I've already got tears in my eyes. That means I'm learning beautifully from you as well. Um, I know some of the things we obviously experienced running a business at home as well as having children at school um, was managing the work-life balance. One of the things we did was that we would run our um, workshops from 9.15 to 3.15 so that we were able to make sure the kids got to school, that our students' kids got to school um, and then we sort of finished it up as the school day finished so parents could go and pick up their kids as well. Um, that was a simple way of helping to deal with work-life balance. Another thing was um, obviously distractions and I bet your kids um, are experiencing that. One of the things we know is we learn really well from social connection. Um, and so kids may be feeling that as well. And yeah, Chris, thank you. Um, balancing work commitments with supporting remote learning. Absolutely. And hopefully we'll give you some great tips for that today. So let's have a look at the latest brain science. The first thing I want you to know is that if we want to support our children to learn, then the best thing we can be is um, calm parents slash carers. When we are calm, there are two little, um, we like to call them fangs, they're called mirror neurons at the front of our brain. And we are the, the leaders in our tribe, so with our, our children. And so if we're calm, our mirror neurons, or our face, sends a message to our children's mirror neurons that it's calm. And with calm comes safety. It becomes much easier to learn. With calm, we're breathing nice and deeply. We relax, we're often smiling. And that says to the kids, okay, I've got this. And they can go away and learn more effect effectively. If we're like and super stressed and a bit frantic, we share that with our kids as well because those emotions are actually contagious. And so by doing that, we actually in, we hinder our children's ability to learn. So the first thing I would say is make sure before the kids sit down to do any learning that you're nice and calm. And before you start the day, do that self-care to make you nice and calm. Um, <laughs> I just saw my husband, my husband put a, a reply to someone in there. Sorry, I got distracted. That never happens. <laughs> so the first thing I would say is absolutely make sure you are calm first because you will support your child in learning more effectively. Um, quick quiz. And again, I'll get you to put this in the chat box. What do you think you can do to increase your child's brain productivity by 31%? In the chat box, 
share what you think that might that thing might be it's nice and simple um, but I'd love to hear what you think might increase your child's brain productivity by 31 percent Mel that's pretty close because it leads to what happens Jay Lee give them breaks I love that it's in addition to both of those I love the fact that you're you're joining in it is the thing that we should all do I love this everyone's joining this is awesome thank you and it comes from everything that you've said. Oh, thank you, everyone. It's beautiful. Mock of everyone, too. Oh, water, yes, people, that is absolute. We need that. The funny thing that increases our kids' learning capacity and brain capacity faster than anything is obviously us being calm, but us smiling. Because when we smile, we say to the kids, you know what? It's okay. You're doing well. So the more you can do the... And obviously a proper smile, which again is why you being calm and relaxed is so important. Now, I noticed that a number of you in your answers, and I love this, picked up the fact that we need food and hydration. We're going to talk about different types of food that will help your kids learn better a little bit later on. That exercise and movement absolutely is so important. I had um, a colleague, sorry, a client the other day on a coaching call and they said that they took their break and them and their child did a yoga session together what a great thing to do any sort of movement helps now one of the things we used to set up in our classroom and i'm going to show you some props here is we would have things like squeezy toys and hopefully you can see those squeezy toys we'd have lots of color pipe cleaners um, also sticky notes so people can write things um, Yes, I'll tell you that, that in a second, Mel. I love that question. Highlighters, pipe cleaners, anything coloured pens here as well. So I've got a number of props. All of those help kids want to learn. It makes it fun. The smile bit is really about these mirror neurons. So the moment we smile, it's the opposite of judgment. It's the opposite of being scared. So smile says to another person, you can, you're safe with me. And so for children, when their parents are smiling, they're like, oh, okay, everything's okay. Whereas if we as parents, because we are the leader of our tribe, the moment we start to frown a little bit, the kids' mirror neurons at the front of their brain, which are the things that um, pick up if someone's um, yawning for argument's sake, it becomes contagious. We now know that emotions are contagious and they're picked up through these mirror neurons. What they do is basically says to the kid, it's okay, says, or says something's not right. And the moment that happens, it takes the blood flow away from the front of the brain, which is where we do all of our learning and thinking mill, and it takes it to the side bit, which is about survival, where we do fight, flight, freeze, or flop. We know that our brain is 2% of our body mass, um, but it uses 20% of our energy, and that's measured through blood flow. So the moment we change from a relaxed state or a smiling state to a bit more stressed state, the blood flow gets stripped away from the thinking part of our brain and given to the survival mechanism. We know that if someone is super stressed, it cuts their IQ in half in seven minutes. This is why as parents, we need to be nice and relaxed, lots of laughter, lots of fun. Um, so in the morning, I would suggest maybe not get on the news if that's something that stresses you. Maybe watch the news in the evening and I would even suggest away from the children because the more we can represent happiness, safety, etc. during this time, the easier our kids will thrive, particularly as they're trying to learn. Um, and we'll send a heap of... Um, resources at the end of this in emails to support any further interest um, or questions you have around that. So the other thing is movement puts blood flow back to the front of the brain, which is why breaks and exercise are really helpful. With that movement too, when we sweat or when our children sweat, our brain releases a chemical called BDNF. It stands for brain-derived neurotropic factor. And what that does is it's like fertilizer for the brain. So it helps the brain make connections much faster. So all of us should be moving during this time. It also lowers our stress and it makes us breathe deeply, which is where our brain goes, oh, it's safe. I can use this part and release the blood flow back up here. So lots of breaks. If your kids are looking stressed, get them up, get them moving. I think another thing, or well, certainly from a... Um, 
brain threat perspective. Plan the day, but plan the day with your children. Maybe even having a family meeting in the morning about what the days are going to look like for everyone. When we give anyone a sense of choice, we give them autonomy. That settles the brain. If we take away autonomy, so if I say to you, you must do this, in your mind, you'll be thinking rude thoughts back at me and I won't do the, the finger that you know I'm thinking of. But what will happen is we'll then go into a threat state because I've taken away your autonomy to have a say in what happens to you. So encouraging a family meeting, encouraging your children to plan their days with you, but for them to have a say in how it works allows them to go to a reward response in their brain versus a threat response. The other thing is, for those of you who have teenagers or perhaps kids who are just not morning children, work with their body clock. You know, one of the things we know is studies are being done at high schools particularly where if the principals delay the starting time by half an hour, the academic grades for those schools go up massively because kids, when they get into that teenagehood, they like to stay up later and for their brain to get enough sleep they need to sleep in a bit later. So if you've got kids who like to sleep in, great. That's a time for you maybe to get in your self-care first and then get some work done if that's important. We've already talked about breaks. We will come back to them. Um, make what they're doing fun, playful. If you can, make it social. So you might say to your children, hey, you know what, I, haven't, I don't really understand this thing and it could be something that they're learning and could you go and do some research for me? Could you come back and teach me? Kids love to be able to share what they know with the adults. It also makes it good for them because they know we don't know everything. They don't have to be perfect. Um, oh, thank you, Jay Leon. I'm just going to come to you what you've said. Go back on what one of the challenges have been is figuring out what all of the new modern strategies are that children are directed to follow, yeah, when doing their English and maths. Yes, compensation, jumping, regrouping, etc. So it's been fun Googling them. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So that's perfect that you'll be graduating with, with your child <laughs> for year four. I think the more we show interest in what our kids are going to learn, they're going to want to um, learn more of it. If we are disinterested, then it's like, well, okay, if parents aren't interested, why should I be interested? So our interest, even just a little bit, tell me more about that. What did you learn today? All of those encourage the kids. Sometimes, I, you know, I love the one earlier where the, the kids um, were swapping their work. And where was it? It was Rebecca who said that. Yeah, you know, that's awesome because they're teaching each other. They're having a bit of fun, which is laughter, and laughter relaxes us. And as I said, actually embeds learning really fast. The other thing is, I think as your kids learn something, we now know that the secret source to get kids to take more action, and it's the same for adults, is when we celebrate. So if your kid comes up and goes, look what I've done, and it's awesome, or even if it's just the first step towards that, do a party dance with them. That releases dopamine, which encourages the child to take more action. To spend time celebrating, yeah, having fun, because it encourages our kids to want to keep doing what they're doing. So the old um, school, and this is when I was at school, the teacher would come in and say, sit down, be quiet, and they'd have a stern look on their face. We now know that is the complete opposite of what is a good learning environment. So certainly wouldn't encourage that. Some other things um, to be aware of, that social bit down there is so important. We now know that social connections are the best antidote basically to um, stresses in life and they are the single most um, reliable source of well-being that we see in terms of psychology, etc. So it helps when we connect socially, it helps us to um, inoculate against mood disorders, etc. So while it's physical distancing, and yes, we still need to make sure we're doing that, the social connections, and it could be, you know, if your kids are at home, obviously they're, they're connected socially face-to-face, -face, but it could also be via a pl platform such as Skype or Zoom, as we're using today, where the kids can see one another. That will, again, make them want to learn more. 
The other thing in terms of some regular break things that you can do, there's a couple of really good apps. Um, and again, we'll share these in the email so you don't need to take net, um, notes if you don't want to. Just Dance Now app. So the kids get up and they move around with their, their phone, etc. Um, YouTube Kids app also has a whole stack of aerobic and uh, workouts and yoga poses that you can do that are ch child friendly. So they are some simple things we can do. When the kids are also planning their day, if they're a bit more visual or tactile, you could get them to set up a colour coded plan for their day. So different colours um, for different things that they're going to do throughout the day day again that gives them the autonomy and makes them want to do it again so we can use um, social um, so Mel um, it was just now app and we will send these out to you and also YouTube kids app both of those um, and Graham might put those in the chat box otherwise I'll write them up a little bit later um, the other thing is sometimes online games can be um, helpful as well and a lot of those suggestions that I just did about the apps, etc., came from an um, article which we'll share with you, which was Homeschooling Tweens and Teens During the Coronavirus by Nur Eel. Um, and again, we'll send those through to you. But that's just some simple things we can do to help our kids learn more. The big thing is if you're having a bad day, I read someone today um, on LinkedIn, they had, they're having just a really horrid day. They said, you know what, kids, just go outside and play. And that was the best thing for everyone's mental health. At the moment, the mental health is so important. So if they don't learn as much today, but they're relaxed and you're relaxed, that's a much better outcome than they're super stressed all day trying to learn everything and they just don't learn anything. So be gentle on yourself and be gentle on them too. One of the things I love, um, and this comes from Carol Dweck, who has a TED talk, which is in the resources section at the end of this video, is she talks about the difference between having a fixed and a growth mindset. And we as parents often set our kids up to fail through our languaging. So it's not that they have failed at anything, they just haven't got it yet. And that word yet is really important. When we put that into um, you know, feedback about how children are doing, it helps them go, oh, okay, well, I need to focus on effort versus a lot of parents, and you know, we have done this in the past until we watched this video, said, oh, you know, you're really smart. When we label or message our children, oh, you must be really smart, they, it becomes part of who they label themselves at. And so if they don't pick something up first go, they'll actually stop trying. And that's a fixed mindset because we've labeled them about it's their brain and their smarts rather than the effort they've put in to learn. So instead of saying you are smart, when they do something well, we say you must have worked hard. I encourage you to watch that Carol Dweck video if you haven't watched it already. It is fabulous um, because at the end of the day, that messaging encourages all of our kids to learn more. Has anyone watched that one? I hope you have. It's just a fabulous one. Feel free to watch Yes in the chat box. Now, there is a book, and I'm just going to show you what this book looks like. It's a fabulous book. It's only recently out. It's called How We Learn, and again, this is in the resources. This particular book has looked at the latest science around learning and compares our learning to machine learning. Fabulous things. And in the book, it comes up with there are four pillars to learning. And the first one is attention. And this is where we put our focus to. So some things we can do, and again, we will write this up for you and actually send it out as a, a checklist or a, a sheet um, with the resources we're going to send you. But to, to build attention for your children, minimise the amount of distractions they have around them. Now, if they're a bit tactile, it might mean that you give them a squeezy ball so they're still moving. But as much as possible, not too many distractions and certainly not your phones, etc., unless they're having to learn on um, a device. The second thing is no one's good at multitasking. Our brain actually, every time we shift from one thing to another, it actually switches focus. That drains our energy really fast and it actually takes about 20 minutes to get back on what we were focusing on initially. So get them to focus on one thing as much as possible rather than multiple things. 
work also with their attention span. So some kids will have a long attention span, some a lot shorter. If it's a lot shorter, don't worry about it. Get them to get up and be a bit active after their attention span has sort of started to wear out and then get them to come back. That break actually allows the brain to file the information. So they're more likely to take in information um, if they've got that shorter attention span, if they have more regular breaks. The other thing is, if we are explaining something to us, children watch where our eyes go. So firstly, if we want to get their attention, we should be looking into their eyes. Now, if you've got multiple children, it's looking at one, getting their attention, looking at the next one, looking at the next one. Then go to what it is that you want to give their, them to give their focus to. So using the eyes is a great way. Pointing to things focuses attention as well. Using a verbal thing and if they're looking at the right thing, the smile helps as well. The other thing is teach them to test what you're teaching them. So say to them, okay, what else can you find out about this? Um, what, what have I told you that maybe isn't correct? By doing that, we make them their own autonomous critical thinkers. And in learning, that is the most important thing. If I can motivate myself to go off and find some new facts and learn some new things and maybe disprove what's been taught to me, I'm a much better learner than one who just sits there going, okay, that must be right, that must be right. And we need this, if you think about this, these times at the moment, this is a perfect skill to be teaching your kids. So teach them to actually be a critical thinker. They don't have to agree with everything. Let them find out what we've, we've taught them that's wrong. They love it, they love teaching us that, that sort of thing. Now, active engagement, which is the second element, is really about curiosity. Because when we engage curiosity in our brain, then our brain basically is looking to test new hypothesis, new hypothesis. <laughs> Good language, hey. Now I've got some, I've, when I was preparing for this, you can see I love sticky notes. I wrote down a heap of tips around this one because the active engagement is so important for your children. For example, many of you will have heard stories of elephants captured from the wild, and the trainer, the elephant trainer will put a ring around the elephant's leg. And this is horrible, but this is what happens. And then they chain it up to a, a stump that the elephant can't move from. And over a little while, the elephant learns, you know, how far it can move on that chain. And at some stage, you can take those chains away and the elephant won't move outside it because the elephant has become a passive elephant. And we now know that active learning is far more important and, and obviously much better than passive learning. So please encourage your kids to ask questions, encourage them to do their own research because that makes them more active. The way kids who learn really well, um, particularly when they're learning new concepts, what they do is the teacher will teach them something and then the child will digest them through their own thoughts and through their own words. So they will play around with the concept that the teacher is teaching. So as adults at home, this is something we can do as well. Okay, go away and um, draw what that means to you or go away and think about that and come back and tell me what you understand I just shared with you. Again, it's making it social. It could, if they're um, quite active and like drawing, help them embed that learning. And it really is allowing them to deepen that learning by thinking about the concept in their own way. Um, the other thing is asking questions. So again, going back to autonomy that we talked about earlier, asking questions allows kids to um, be an active learner and also have autonomy about how they solve that particular issue. Um, the other thing is, if you can use a physical object, I'll uh, say this ball, to teach concepts. So we now know that if I want to teach a physics concept about, I don't know, gravity, I would be better giving the child a ball and getting them to play with that ball and then coming back to me with what they've learned than talking at them for 10 minutes and having and demonstrating it to them myself. So them being involved with it, having a physical object, again, can make it really easy. And this, you know, little age, you know, from little ones to 
you know, nearly in year 12, year 12 kids can learn by using physical objects. Other things that make learning active um, are practical activities, discussions, small group work. Again, you could use online such as Zoom for kids to do that discussion. And the other thing that's really cute, and I think this we can all do as, as parents is when the kids are doing something and maybe they're just getting a little bit disrupted is, is interrupt and say, hey kids, and come up with a question that is a bit difficult for them to know the answer. So they're going to have to do a little bit of work. That's a great way again, to get them curious about what they're learning. So maybe Google you know, a fun fact about the topic they're going to learn and then um, get them to go off and do some research or thinking amongst themselves. The big thing I think here is laughter. If the kids do something and it's hilarious and they learn something from, join in and encourage that laughter because it actually helps embed our learning much faster. So sometimes they might be able to learn a concept, say a science concept, by watching a funny YouTube video that we've obviously looked at before that demonstrates what not to do and what happened when that person did. That can sometimes teach them, oh, okay, that's hilarious won't do that, let's watch it now when it did work, oh, okay, get it, can see the difference. So think about fun ways that you can help them learn. The other thing is this energy hungry beast, particularly this part of our brain, um, and you do this yourself. So I just want you to think about yourself. If you're on social media, you'll go, do, 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 boom. And you'll give attention to something that is new or interesting or personal. So we know that we call it, use the acronym NIP, New Interesting Personal, allows information to get into this front part of the brain the fastest. So if I said, hey, Mel, did you know um, this fun fact about this thing? Mel would go, oh, she just said my name. And all of a sudden, she'd start paying attention. Um, and in that instance, this brain's wide open and curious. The opposite is also true. The reason you swipe things and the reason kids don't learn certain things is the moment it is boring, our brain says, uh-uh, not interested in chewing all this energy on something that's boring. So if we need kids to relearn stuff, trying to think about ways to make it new, interesting or personal can help take something from a boring concept to something that they're actually willing to learn. Anything boring, our brain literally overrides us and goes, uh-uh, don't want to learn. The same with if it's too novel or it's too complex or too um, curious, sorry, too confusing, that shuts down our curiosity. So there's a, there's a happy medium level where we will learn stuff and one where we'll go too hard. If it's really complex, we might need to break it down into little chunks for them to learn better. The other thing is you can ask as the learner, hey, what I don't know about this yet is, could you go and find some stuff out for me? Kids, again, love to teach their adults. The big thing is sometimes we actually don't reward curiosity. So some things to remember, particularly if you're a little bit frustrated trying to balance that work life um, with the kids learning, is when the kids come to you to go, hey, mum, hey, dad, take a deep breath and then turn around and focus on them. Don't go, yeah, 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 because that is not rewarding their curiosity. So encourage them to ask questions. Get them to do presentations on stuff that they're learning and they're loving. And if they take initiative and it's not right, that's okay. Reward that initiative and say, you know what? I'm so proud of you. You work really hard to do that. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, just like I've been talking a lot at the moment, so your, your brain's probably going, oh, please stop, Danette, you're giving us too much information, is that if we talk too much, the kids don't learn. It really is about questions. And at the end of the day, if we're interested, they're going to be interested. So I'm curious, I've talked about attention and active engagement, and I've talked too long, so my apologies. Have you got any questions or any suggestions about things that you've tried or things that have worked or haven't worked? So in the chat box, I'd love to hear some of your um, questions and or sharings at this stage.
or any ahas you've just got by what I've been discussing. The more you do that, I'm going to have a glass of water. No questions? All right. Well, I will keep going. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm much more engaged now. I love that lunchtime lull. Yes, perhaps my husband says, my 13-year-old is struggling with the isolation. And he's feeling very down. Um, so in this instance, I would absolutely suggest if, if they can get on something like Skype or FaceTime, if you've got access to Zoom, and Zoom does have a free version, and encouraging him to connect um, with you know, his friends, maybe um, other family members, etc. Even seeing them this way will boost how he feels. If he can um, get a couple of school friends together, they could go through some of the work together online. Um, so if, you, if that would be helpful, that's certainly a way just to encourage that social aspect. The other thing is, um, my and Graham will put this in the chat because I can't remember, I think it's called House Party. Um, there's an app you can get on your phone called House Party and, and it's a bit like Zoom, but it has games on it as well. That can be a nice way to, for them just to connect in their breaks. So, you know, if his friends are sitting down learning, maybe at lunchtime they have 15 minutes or 20 minutes just connecting at the same time playing those games too. And it is called House Party. Thank you. And uh, that was a great question. Thank you. Okay. Now, error feedback, which is the second last one, is... Knowing that when a kid makes a mistake, it's actually part of learning. So we don't actually learn without making mistakes. So don't make a big thing if they make a mistake and they're not learning the first or the second time. The other thing is the way we learn could be very different from our children. So it is important to recognise if I'm teaching my child and they're not getting it, probably it's how I'm teaching them. And I'll give you some tips shortly about how you can work out their style and also some ways to help different types of learners. So just recognise, hey, we haven't got this yet. The other thing is surprise. When something doesn't work out as we expect, our brain goes, oh, because that's interesting and it's new. And so our brain lights up and wants to understand why. So when, when they go, oh, I wasn't expecting that. So you could ask them, okay, you're going to try this experiment. What are you expecting as a result? And they go this, and when they do it, it doesn't work. You go, oh, okay. What do you think that is? Oh, oh yes, and thank you. Quiplash is another good um, thing. So I'm just reading the chat box. So get feedback about that. You know, if they're, if they're surprised, okay, why do you think that happens? And again, notice the neutral language I'm, I'm using. Get them to test what they think the answer is. So them to do it rather than us. The more we test ourselves, the more confident we become. It's when we are sitting in exams and someone's grading us, that causes a lot of pressure. But if a kid can go off and test themselves, say on an online quiz, or they've got cards, etc., then it's a relaxed environment. They're going to learn better. The other thing is we know that learning embeds if we review it. So, for example, if, if a child needs to remember something in two weeks' time, in them reviewing it every day or so will help embed that. And they would review it and not just read the same thing, but you might ask them a different question to help embed that learning. Now, if the learning is a much longer time frame, then you would um, basically, you do it on a 20% proportion. So if I need to remember something in 10 months, then I might review it for a couple of days first week, maybe one day the next week, and then I might wait next month and then... At two months, I do a reasonable, reasonably good review. In 10 months' time, I'll have a good knowledge of that particular thing based on that review. So reviewing it is actually about embedding that learning. Um, and for longer time frames, if it's, you use a 20%. So if I want to know it in 10 months, then I need to review it up to about two months. You can keep reviewing it afterwards, but that certainly helps, that constant review. It's why we do email campaigns now after our learning. We do short micro-learnings afterwards to keep embedding the learning for our people. The last one is consolidation. 
this is practice makes perfect over time. So we keep practicing. The more we do it, it becomes a, a routine, which is a neural pathway in our brain, which means we can do it without thinking. So most of you probably learnt your timetables by rote. And if I said two times two, everyone, two times two in the chat box, what does that equal? Anyone? Come on, it's a question. <laughs> Thank you, Jaylee. Oh, everybody. Oh, I love it. Party dance, all of those of you who quickly just put it in there. Yeah, it's full because we've wrote, learned it. And you could be doing something else and you, you hear that and you go, oh, I know that. It's full. Um, and obviously I gave you an easy one. But the more the kids continue to, to do that learning, it's why refreshing and renewing is really good. The other thing that is most important um, is that sleep. So sleep, we now know, consolidates learning. It makes new connections in our brain with that learning, which is why, um, you know, when they talked about Einstein thinking about the theory of relativity or gravity or whatever it was, he was supposedly daydreaming under an apple tree and the apple fell out of the tree. Our brain, when we're napping and when we're sleeping, does all of the heavy lifting of learning. So encouraging your children to take naps if they're tired during the day, do exercise if they're tired during the day, and getting a good night's sleep is really, really important. And for us as adults too. <laughs> so we learn in a lot of different ways. And um, some we use all of these preferences, but each child and each adult will have slightly different preferences. So some are more audio, sorry, visual, some are more auditory, some are more kinesthetic or what we call tactile and some of us as learners will be more logical or more creative. We can tell through our eye movement and also the language we use and again we'll send more resources out on this. A person whose first preference or primary preference is visual will look up when we ask a remembering question such as what did you do yesterday and they'll use visual words such as see and look. Or they might say, I don't have clarity. That's telling me they're more visual. So I would show them rather than talking at them too much. Someone who's more auditory will look sideways with that same question. What did you do yesterday? They'll look sideways and they'll use auditory words such as sounds, hear. Um, and again, we'll send more resources. A person who's more tactile will look down. They will often show you their tactile because they will be moving a lot. They might be doodling. That, that actually... If they're doodling, means they're still listening to you. Don't take it as a sign that they're not listening. They actually need to move to learn. They look down and they will use feeling and movement words to uh, explain what it is they did yesterday. Person who's highly logical will look straight ahead and they, if they are detailed, will use step by step by step. So some things that we can do for each of those, um, a visual learner will prefer things like books, pictures, charts, slides, etc. Using things like sticky notes um, with colour, coloured pens, give them time to go over and visualise what it is they've just learned. And please make sure, while I said having things like sticky notes and coloured pens is important, don't have too many other visual distractions around them. If a child is more auditory, often they will like a quiet space. Headphones can be quite helpful to allow them silence. Asking them questions and talking and listening to them is a great way. You can also get them to record stuff or to repeat stuff out loud. Jeremy, who I know is um, on this call, he's monitoring our Facebook live chat. He's, uh, or he used to be very auditory and he still is. He used to rap out singing, um, sorry, rap out spelling when he was learning long words. So it's a really fun way of doing things. They'll also like listening and learning through audio books and podcasts. And again, we've put a number of resources at the end of this webinar. My tactiles love movement. So get them up, get them moving. Um, they can actually design things and, and I saw someone had a uh, was teaching an electric circuit for physics and they actually made it out of pieces of paper at, on the floor so they cleared space on the floor and then just put pieces of paper demonstrating the arrows etc what they did to learn that the more they can be moving the better and frequent breaks really important my logicals will tend to like flowcharts, dot points, make sure that you're teaching them 
A, B, C, not A, C, B, because it, it will just be quite confusing. At the end of the day, my logicals tend to like really quite structured, goal orientated activities. So when I do this, I'll get this. Your creative learners will like you to say, hey, I'd like you to go and think and come up with an answer for this. Now, again, each of your children will be different. They will be potentially different from you. So if your approach to teaching them isn't working, perhaps look at some of these other ones and bring more of those types of activities or resources, such as the sticky notes, into the learning environment for them. And there's my creatives. Okay, question. And I know some of you know this because you've been on other webinars. For those of you who don't, haven't been on an earlier webinar, what increases our focus by 30%, our creativity by 48% and our child's health and well-being by 46%? And my husband said wagon wheels. <laughs> I don't believe him there. <laughs> Anyone know? This is actually a really important one. I'm just going to move something so it's on my... Okay, I'm going to put you out of your misery. It is breaks. So we know there's a lot of science. Um, this comes from 2007 Harvard Business Review, that when we um, take regular breaks, so it could be the children study for 25 minutes um, and then oh, yeah, 25 to 30 minutes and then have a 5, 10 minute break and then start again. It allows their brain to refresh, embed that learning and come back fresh and renewed. So please, regular breaks absolutely a part of their good learning. The other thing is when we take those breaks because we're generally moving, it boosts our energy, it absolutely increases their pro productivity and um, focus and it reduces their stress. Finally, it is literally where our brain does the hard work. Taking breaks, taking naps, taking sleep, all are where our brain does the most work. So in the breaks, and I know a number of us have talked in the other webinars, we've spoken about most of these. I would encourage your kids to do stretching, really good for them. Getting outside, outside is really, will help soothe them and um, limit their stress. If they can't go outside, maybe just watching, Googling um, nature meditation video, and they could watch the ocean or a stream or something. For two minutes, it's going to calm them down. They'll breathe deeper. They'll be more effective in their learning. Let's talk about food and hydration. Oh, and then let me do or no social media. So Zoom or Skype or FaceTime, they're not social media. They're a way of socially connecting. When I get on um, Facebook, etc., that limits my ability to actually be very proactive and it has a lot of distractions. So I don't encourage social media in breaks, um, so much as you could say at the end of today, yes, you can get on and get on social media a bit later on in the evening or the afternoon. So just some quick tools and techniques because I am conscious of time. Make sure you use their learning preference and movement, make it multi-century, breaks fun and absolutely, if you can take them outside for a little while during the day, please do. Look at their learning space or spaces and just make sure that it is good from a work health safety perspective because if it isn't, they'll actually struggle to because they're uncomfortable. So make sure they've got the screen, if they're using a screen, you know, in the appropriate proportion with their eyes and make sure they're sitting on something that is comfortable. From time to time, it's okay for them to go from sitting to standing up, stretching, moving, etc. Um, they may have more than one space. So you might have a, a quiet space for learning things like maths and stuff. And then you might have a more active space if they've got the family. Oh, I love this. Yeah, Joanne, the kids moving between table to a beanbag, etc. That movement is great because it's actually helping them delineate different learning areas. And we now know that we learn best not by learning in one area. We learn by learning in different areas. So keep your kids doing that, Joanne. That's awesome. Couple of things to know about their brains and your brains. 
our brain eats every three hours whether we are eating or not so it is really important to feed your kids every two to three hours now having them graze throughout the day is actually better for them and their learning than giving them one or two quite heavy big meals we all know you know that afternoon snooze feeling at about three o'clock because we've had a big lunch or you know it even happens half an hour after lunch smaller natural um, wholesome products like fruit veggies etc grazed upon throughout the day will actually help their brain be fueled better and more effectively they won't get that slump so things that are wholesome nutritious seeds are really good pumpkin seeds are fabulous nuts if obviously if they don't have allergies fruits vegetable hummus Hummus and vegetables are brain food. And Nick, no, unfortunately, wagon wheels after, after the end of the school day is probably better than during the school day. With anything sugar, kids get the quick boost of energy, but then they get the slump straight after. And we all know this. I oh, know. <laughs> My husband just said I'm a party pooper. <laughs> um, uh, so just, we know that if we have so they know countries with the highest sugar consumption also have the highest depression rates so please low or no sugar snacks and food is much better during the the day for your kids learning and lots and lots of water make sure that they've got whether it's glasses or bottles of water um, around the house everywhere encourage them set alarms you have a bottle of water um, or a drink of water every hour make sure your kids join in it could be a fun activity who can drink the most water now <laughs> so i'm curious what are some of the things you're going to work on moving forward and i know i've given you a lot of information so some of you will probably have to come back um, and maybe re-listen but again feel free to reach out to us what are you going to do differently moving forward Beautiful, Nick. Thank you. More breaks. And yeah, it's a great. It's great for us as adults as well. Look at their work more um, during the day. Beautiful, Joanne. Um, you're waiting for the end of the day. Yep, and more breaks. Beautiful, Jaylee. More breaks, less rig. I love that. Having more fun. Pippa, find out my son's learning preference. Beautiful. We'll share some resources to help you with that. Um, beautiful, Chris. Yeah, I like the idea of using objects to explain concepts. There's some simple things we can do just to help our kids. At the end of the day, this is a time for us to reconnect with our kids and to show them that they matter and what they're learning matters too. So just a couple of resources um, that we will share with you and links. Um, Joanne, I love that you're going to put a craft box together. That's awesome. Um, which include the Carol Dweck video there as well. Food is really important. One of the things I think that could be a great outcome of what's going on at the moment is we all get better at eating healthier food. Yesterday, Graham and I ducked out one day a week, which is on Wednesdays. There is a green grocer that a Jugion goes to Sydney um, to the markets and brings back beautiful, fresh produce. And so every Wednesday, we now make it a habit of going and picking up that fresh fruit and veggies. To get your kids involved in cooking is another great way of teaching them and sometimes we learn ourselves. So they included some great books, uh, sorry, great links there. The book Spark by John Ratey is fabulous in terms of the importance of exercise. If your child exercises before they start schoolwork, their grades will go up because of the impact of the blood flow um, on the brain and the release of the BDNF. Um, the brain derived neurotropic factor. Highly encourage that book for every parent to read. Now we do, we're doing a number of free uh, webinars. We also always do one skill set a month. We're doing Managing Upwards on Wednesday, the 8th of April. There are a whole stack of other free webinars if you haven't been on any of them. I know a number of you have, and if you have, welcome back. Um, if you have any other ideas of free videos and webinars that we could do to help, please just send an email to learn at magicallearning.com. We would love to hear from you. Now, is there any final questions before we finish? 
And I love, again, the interaction today. You're doing really well because it is lunchtime and you're probably a little hungry too. While you're thinking of those questions, I'll just put this last slide up there. Um, I would, if, if you are looking for fun solutions, etc., we are using social media as a way of helping people this month with resources and tools. I believe today we're sharing a video um, by Chris, and I can't remember Chris's last name, who was, has gone to space a number of times, and he talks about his tips for social isolation and, in fact, about social connection. So I would encourage you to join us on um, any of the social media platforms as well if, if we can be of service to you. And as I said, please feel free to reach out if you've got questions or you need additional support. Learn at magicallearning.com. We are here to help you and we will all get through this stronger. This is a fabulous opportunity for us all to reconnect with our loved ones and to engage our kids in being curious again about learning. So I hope, thank you, it's Chris Hadfield. Thank you, Graham. I hope you, this has been helpful. Um, stay safe, stay well, and virtual hugs to you all. And thank you, everyone.